So we're one man short today. Yep, the uh, um, MVP is gone, so we get to hey, see who's uh, second dog. Oh man, uh, it's been a it's been a it's been a crazy week, huh? Yeah. It has, man. We uh, um, we're in design mode still. Like we are kind of late for our 2024 designs, but we're still doing a lot of design work. So I've been like, I've had my uh, Pharrell cap on, um, you know, Louis Vuitton Pharrell cap on last couple weeks. So. It's been fun. Did you see I his, love uh, design mode. He did a collab with uh, Tiffany and Co, which is also owned by LVMH. But you see that? No, I didn't. I gotta, yeah, I gotta so check that Pharrell, out. That sounds awesome. Pharrell jewelry by Tiffany and Co. Uh, no, it's it's a market, right? Like it's interesting that uh, men's jewelry is still a market, and not very many people capitalize on that. And Tiffany is a jewelry house, so. It'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Louis Vuitton made Virgil a household name, not Virgil making Louis Vuitton popular, right? Like, it seems like Louis Vuitton is trying to use Pharrell's name to sell more product. You know, I don't know about that. I think, I think Virgil made his own name through Off-White, right? I think the Off-White collabs with Nike and LVMH and Supreme, I think... I think it's in this scenario. I think it's it's you're right. I think Pharrell is is helping Louis Vuitton sell more to the mainstream and and, and more of the male audience. Um, but in the case of Virgil, I still think Virgil had his own name, um, and his his off white was really the one that really took off. Versus Pharrell never had a, like a his clothing brand was what uh, was it not human or not I forgot what the shoe brand was, uh, human or not human that he did. Um, I don't think he had a big like you know product or merchandise name uh, versus where uh, Virgil had its own brand and still has it. I mean, you know, God rest his soul, but he still has a brand. Right? Off White's still a brand. Off White's still pretty big uh, in in the industries that it's in. Yeah, for sure. But speaking of trends and what's happening, um, this is my week, so we are going to talk trends um, first off, and then um, then we'll talk. We'll dive into some rebrands. I think it's it's been the year of a rebrand, at least. I've been looking at it and seeing all these new logos pop up and these new conversations. So, um, so let's uh, let's hit it. Men go mad. Who's gone mad? Mad men. You're mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. mad. Back to basics. Doing a trend episode. This is always. <laughs> these are always fun. I love talking trends. So then, uh, why don't we uh, why don't we tee it off with uh, you? You want to go first? Yeah, man, I got a cool one actually. So uh, I was playing with this app uh, two days ago, and it, I was having a blast with it. But it's called the UMAX. Have you heard of this? No, man, I'm not. So I've I'm started wearing collars because uh, you know, co- like apparently you got to maximize maximize your look, uh, and that's uh, that's exactly what this app kind of tells you how to do is. Um, it's ran by this one dude. You won't believe it. One dude in doing $6 million annually. Uh, and it's just a single function <laughs> app. Um, it's us based. So it's not like Russian Facetune or, you know, in these Chinese apps that just do random filters. He's built this app completely on AI on a simple premise on to see how hot you look. Um, and what's the, you know, it's all about your physical features. Uh, so what he does is like you open up the app, it tells you to load a few photos in. So front selfies, a couple angle views, and then a side selfie. And then, um, it says, uh, it says, would you like to see how you're rated across the few million users that have used this app? And, uh, and I said, of course, I want to see how I rate. He says, okay, but you got to pay four ninety nine. I said, okay, sure, let's do it. <laughs> Consumerism <laughs> so always gets a deal. A consumer man strikes again. So, uh, <laughs> so I pay the four ninety nine, uh, and then it it does his analytics and stuff, and it tells me um, your boy got some interesting stats. You got, I, I'm gonna make you proud here, Salim. You're not the only good looking one in our group. So <laughs> I would take the app. Uh, so. I'm rated a 72, right? So like in on a scale of 10, it's a it's a 7.2. But it also tells you your potential. So I have the potential of being an 85. So I have some room uh, to get better. My masculinity, this will even tell you, it obviously tells you if you're, it asks you if you're a boy or girl. Uh, but 
Uh, my masculinity, masculinity is at an 82. So, uh, you know, there you go. Bullies back in high school. I'm a man. And then, uh, cheekbones, I'm struggling though, apparently. So I'm at a 51 when it comes to cheekbones. So it's like, you know, my jawline and cheekbones need to get defined a little bit more. Uh, but wait, there's more. So uh, oh, while you're waiting for these analytics to come through, it'll prompt you uh, to see using these same selfies that you just put in while the analytics are happening. It'll say, would you like to see how you'd look like as a 10? And I said, sure. And it says, oh, but you have to pay six ninety nine. <laughs> so this is an additional fee that I said, okay, I'll pay the six ninety nine. And then, uh, so I, I, we got to ask the video editor to show what, or we'll have him drop the photos of how it looked like. I'll send it to you guys. But, um, but I should have known they added hair, you know, as like, a, <laughs> if you would have, I don't think people on the channel know that you're bald, by the way. Yeah. yeah you I always wear a hat. hat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they, uh, so they added hair and gave me abs. So we'll go to, and I'll send that to you guys. But, um, but I heard about this through one of my favorite podcasts called my first million. And, um, but I got to thinking when I was listening to them talk about it, I was like, this would be a really cool way for to get customer engagement and to get your brand um, for people to buy your brand, right? So we know uh, male uh, skincare, male cosmetics is on the rise. Um, we saw number one pick in the NFL draft, Caleb Williams, proudly putting his nail polish on, lip gloss and everything. Um, rather than having a, uh, a service where we pay for like the AI results, it would be really cool to see Caldera Lab or CeraVe or any of these other male cosmetic lines like Jack Black and all them. They could potentially do uh, an app like this and it just recommends you products then, right? So it'll show, oh, this is what you would look like after 30 days of using our product. Um, and you get, you know, before and after photos uh, all generated through AI. So I think that's kind of a trend that I think I'm foreseeing that this is going to be um, a way that brands will leverage AI to suggest their consumer products. Are you using, the uh, by the way, do, do, you, do you use any kind of like male uh, skincare or like do you have a routine for that? I, I do have a skincare routine and, and, and for the record, it's not, I don't even think it's a male oriented skin routine. It's my wife's skin routine. She just, I use her stuff. Like she's like, use this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, cool. I think it's one product that I have. It's like some purple, I don't even know what it's called. It's some purple thing. And, um, you know, you put it on your eyes for these, you know, weird baggy eye things. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we use it. Um, but you know, L'Oreal did, did a, uh, announcement I want to say about six months ago where they did they, they're kind of in this direction kind of what you're talking about where AI comes in you take a photo of yourself and it recommends products for you um, I don't know if it works on males um, because they did a demo on females because they've def definitely that's the first market that they're going to go for but um, I think you're you're on to something right I think they're they're definitely um, in that direction um, and I think it's going to help um, hopefully that uh, as, as the models get better uh, but my question really is, is that you heard this on a podcast and I just looked at their website. I looked at their social media and it's just blank. Like, how does this guy, it's so interesting that you're like talking about this and there's millions of users apparently. And he conned you into paying 15 bucks, which totally conned you into it because there's no way you can validate that number. I don't know. What do you put it on your Tinder account? Um, and say, Hey, look, I, according <laughs> to you, <laughs> I'm like a 78, but yeah. Um, I wonder if that works. Um, but like it's an interesting product because the marketing of it, like it's like, it's, it doesn't have any, like, it's just, you go to the website, it's just blank. It's just a logo blank. You go to the social media apps and it's got six images on, on Instagram and it's blank. Like it's interesting. Um, I mean, if he's got a million users, so, he's banging bucks. It's cool. So he has a, he has like a growth mechanism put in. So if you don't want to pay, you can invite friends. And if they like, if you get a certain number of accepted invites, then you get your results and everything for free. Uh, I didn't really want to publicize that I was, uh, I was seeing how hot I was like using this app and then inviting my friends to also do the same, but now I'm putting it on our podcast. So everyone will know, but <laughs> the, to our, to it's, millions uh, of subscribers. <laughs> yeah. Well, th the point here is that it's like, 
uh, he, it's total guerrilla marketing. And I, I honestly think like the new, like it's kind of a flex not having a social media and having insane growth um, because you're that thing that people, you're that like secret thing that only a select few know of, but really millions know of because word spreads fast. Uh, as long as you have those like affiliate ways of growing or uh, I, it's insane how many um, small brands blow up just using Reddit now you know and this is what he yeah. used is he used reddit and he blew up so no and again it's it's i i you know over it's interesting because i've been talking to a lot of different orgs and different companies lately and and it's like hey and part of them is, is is that they're bringing me on to consult with them to talk about hey how do they do growth marketing and uh in general and it, it these guys are like seven figures nine figure companies that have just been kind of growing by word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, and um, now they're, you know, trying to accelerate themselves, but um, there's a lot of companies still out there. There's millions of companies out there that are just growing on their, uh, their limbs of, of, of being a good product, good customer service. And, you know, then they get, you know, internal data uh, to help them grow that. Um, so yeah, it's cool, man. Good, good product. Yeah, really cool good trend. What, what, what do you think is trending? What do you got? So, I don't know if you've heard of this, but uh, have you heard of the world's first zero carb, zero alcohol, zero taste beer? Okay, so this is water. <laughs> well, it's not basically water; it's really just water. So I'm gonna introduce you to Liquid Debt's first official competitor in the market, and it's called Not Beer. So basically, what Not Beer is doing is mocking all the memes about the fake light beers that all these brands are coming out with. And playing it to an advantage by building sparkling water that looks basically like a Budweiser can. So if you look at the can, um, it's basically a Budweiser can. Um, and the other thing that they're taking advantage of is, is they're starting this in a right wing Texas market first. So you'll see this in your stores and you'll, you'll see it from us. But it's it, he's he's building this company on the idea of the you know the whole hype of liquid death and you know liquid death being evaluated a million a billion dollars now, um, just being a water company um, and saying hey look we're we're just gonna break that market and build it even more and and we're gonna be true American and you know the, the like I said they're starting in Texas right wing Texas is gonna focus on those saying hey look we're American this is American thing to do and drink. Um, so it's it's got some really big backing. One of the guys who backed Liquid Death is also backing this company, um, and I think it's gonna. I mean, it's gonna really shake up this weird uh, can water market that is. Um, but yeah, I think there was a there's a TikTok about a like a. Do you know there's a water sommelier? Yes, I I actually know this because <laughs> I came across uh, some video, and it was not TikTok because it was a long video. I think it was YouTube or something, but. It was just like him testing all sorts of waters and like, you know, but keep going. Yeah, but they basically there was a you know water sommelier talking about the two you know liquid death and and why uh, this is better than liquid death and it's just a it's just an interesting market to see water breaking the market once again. Yeah, it's uh, this is like exact copy playbook of like uh, liquid death, but what makes it different you're absolutely right is like the vintageness of it i could see why they're going after like i'm looking at their website right now it has that very old school beer look um versus like liquid death kind of has like a craft beer type of look yeah. uh yeah. so this kind of makes it look like like old school budweiser you know like it has red can and uh even the uh, the media on like uh it's showing vintage uh convertibles and you know <laughs> things like that um a very vintage uh vintage media on it so it's it's pretty cool um i actually had a concept for when i saw liquid death succeed in this way um i tried or i i think i still own it no i maybe i don't own it so uh but i will buy it if it's still available godwater.com uh oh. and it was going to be the race, race, the race the first to buy it <laughs> well <laughs> so i it was available and I was just like, am I really going to go start a water company? I have like so many other things I have, I should be doing, but, uh, but the, it was the antithesis for liquid death and it was going to be all like angels and like feeling upliftment or like, you know, like feeling good drinking water. Um, and, uh, but not beer sounds awesome too. Like this is really nice. I'm going to go buy God water if it's available. Hold please. <laughs> Do it right now. Um, but I want to talk about a few other trends that have been happening, Bill, and kind of get your thoughts on it. Um, 
you know, one of them is, is, is our, I, I'm sure you, you shopped there when you were younger. I definitely did. And a lot of these brown people did was Express just filed bankruptcy. I don't know how you feel about that, but what are you, what are you thinking about a company like Express filing bankruptcy? Man, you know, it's, uh, sadly, this is, it's, it's just the beginning. Um, we are seeing a lot of companies sitting on a lot of inventory right now, man. Like we, we sell to some national retailers and, um, they would always be ready to buy product from us. Like as soon as we had inventory, they'd be like, yeah, send it, you know? And now those same companies are like, uh, I think we're good for now. Like we're, we're not, we're actually on a buying freeze. Like our, um, you know, the executives have told us not to buy so much anymore. So, um, so we're, we're starting to see that, uh, that effect from this, from where we are, uh, we're, we're trying to be really, really smart with our own manufacturing because we don't want to be left over with any product. But, um, you know, companies like Express, it's, you know, this this will kind of go into your third segment that you've listed for us. But it's like in person versus online. They had some really big overhead to pay for. And then when you get stuck with inventory on top of that, that's like, I mean, you're, you're just perfect recipe for closing shop but you know look i think there's something else to this right i think they just have not been innovative enough right i think express from like a brand standpoint and from a clothing company standpoint like you look at companies like banana republic who's been the staple like as as express was right they're pretty much in line of timeline wise and they've just refreshed themselves recently um and now they're they're leading brand like they're they're one of the top you know you know mid-level brands for 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 both male and female now um, I don't think Express has been innovative enough. And I think brick and mortar, you talk about it, you talk about brick and mortar and how it's going, having struggles, but you see companies like Hollister on the other side, right? Hollister is going away from brick and mortar and found a whole new world in online business. So they're not filing bankruptcy per se, but they're just, you know, transitioning saying, Hey, look, I can sell better online than I can in store. They're kind of doing what other companies are doing backwards, right? Saying, Hey, look, instead of going from online to brick and mortar, they're going from brick and mortar to online and they're doing really well. So I think part of this is Express's own fault, right? I think they've just not been able to innovate enough and, and be, you know, go with the times, uh, get on the social media bandwagon. And part of that time time tells me it's always upper level management that just refuses to to adjust and change and, and bring on new talent to go and, and disrupt the market, uh, especially in a market yeah. that's so saturated like clothing. It's, it's really interesting because American Eagle is another one that uh, is due for something exciting. Yeah. They, we never saw it again. Uh, but on the flip side, the the brand that's totally mastered it, and it's still a mystery on how they were able to do it, was Abercrombie & Fitch. Um, I mean, they have made such a 180 in going from the, you know, the complete jock uh, look and, you know, the high school jock look to now being the brand for everyone and even non-binary and, like, it's it's amazing what they've been able to do so that's going to be studied very closely for uh american eagle for um i'm trying to think there's probably some other ones out there even victoria's secret they need to figure something out too i mean they they've struggled to figure out how they're gonna flip their brand around too uh you know and express you're absolutely right they had they didn't do anything innovative and uh just kind of fell into this trap of like where they were known for these colorful button down shirts and then, then what, you know, like they tried the whole lion, lion polo and this and that. And just like, I don't know. How do you leverage that? Right. Like, how do you, how do you become better again? They could have gone into work leisure, right? Like what, uh, cuts clothing did. Like, um, since people did come to you for button downs and stuff, say like, you know, you sell more casual office wear, um, things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. The other two topics, the other one I want to talk about is, is I don't know if you saw the Bluey uh, commercial, the Zillow, Zillow Bluey ad. Have you seen that? Your, your kids watch Bluey still? Oh, man. Um, okay, so they do, but they don't. Um, anytime they watch it, they love it, but we don't really have a, they change shows week to week. My kids are a little different <laughs> where like, you know, we watch a lot of PBS, um, but what, what's, what's special about this? All, all I saw was people so, so- crying. Yeah, so that's what basically happened. And what I want to talk about in this ad specifically was is that so in the in, in the show Bluey, they finally move, right? So they finally move out of that house, um, and that's what you know. That's what the, the emotion is: is that they're moving out of the house and they're crying because hey, this is they've been in this house forever. They kind of like how we are, right? 
So what, what Zillow did was very interesting was that they did, I don't think they had the rights to go talk about Bluey because, you know, that'd have to be a collab, but they vaguely you know, have a dog sitting in the front door. Um, mm-hmm. And then they very mentioned quietly that, Hey, you know, compared to a show that just like, uh, you know, crying over a show that we just saw somebody move out of, it should always be a part, part of being excitement. Like they kind of misleadingly mentioned it without actually mentioning it. And I think that was a masterclass of saying, Hey, how do I take a, a momentum you know, that's already going in the market without, you know, the, you know, the copyright problems and the, you know, royalty stuff and just say, Hey, look, can I, can I reference it without referencing it? And and they did this beautiful ad. So if you've got a chance to check it out, I'd say go check that out. It's, it's, it's really pretty impressive. Uh, so this that. is uh Oh, dude, you did not mention this is from Ryan Reynolds. This, uh, Oh yeah, ad. that is, that is, that is deep impact. Yeah. What was it deep impact? I forgot what it's company's name, but yeah, it's Ryan Reynolds is a uh, ad company. Agency. That is so cool. Yeah, he's he's something else, dude. Uh, you yeah. can do a whole episode of Ryan Reynolds and his his ability to market. Um, and I want to see his U Max rating. Oh god, the, um, Ryan Reynolds is U Max rating. That's what I want to see. I think that, I think it's probably what the top tier is. It's like the ten out of ten is Ryan Reynolds, and everything below <laughs> that is is everything else. And then last one I'll talk about on the on the trend side is this power of influencers, and this is maybe a little bit old news. I know this happened a few weeks ago, but. Um, MKBHD is uh, Marcus Brownlee. I don't know if you know him. He's a he's a huge uh, I love viewer on, on YouTube, and, and lately he's been getting you know everybody's been saying cancel MKBHD because of a few reviews that he's done about products. Uh, Humane AI being one of them, Fisker Ocean being another one, um, and I think there's another one of the Rabbit or Rabbit AI or something. Like he's given bad reviews in the past, and most people have taken the bad reviews and said, "Hey, let me go fix this." Uh, but then now he's getting a lot of heat because these are all like startups, Humane and, and, and Rabbit, Fisker, not so much, but, um, and he's just getting, you know, heated up and he came up with a video and then said, Hey, look, my job is not to, to the companies. My job is to the people. And if, if you make shit product, you got to get shit reviews. Like don't send, don't, don't charge me $700 for a product that sucks. <laughs> um, but my question is, 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 is like the power of influencer review? Like, is it really the power of him? Is like, is it really that? this guy has his audience and he made a bad review and uh, or is it really that it just timing of everything just worked out against the people? You know, it, it's, you bring up an interesting thing, but uh, because I love MKBHD, like he's someone that honestly like influenced me to buy a Tesla for the first time. Um, you know, when he, when he, when I was looking at a Rivian, I looked at, I watched his review of it. Yeah. Um, he said what everyone was thinking about the humane product, by the way, like everyone felt like who's actually going to use this, the AI pin. And I said on this, on this show that I thought it was really cool, but ultimately I knew I was never going to buy it. And I knew that I was in, I'm consumer man. Like, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) even as consumer man, even as consumer man, I was not going to buy this. And so he said exactly what everyone was saying. And, you know, if you're going to have this really dramatic release, the way, um, humane did for the, their AI pin, uh, you know, they, they went all out, right. They had all the press, they did everything right. They dropped Johnny Ives name, everything. They did everything right when it came to a, a release and then the product was lacking. You need it. I mean, you got to take the punch to the, to the jaw right like that's what it all comes down to um and steve jobs said it best is like you may have really good marketing and people may come to you once but if you have a shit product they'll never come to you again you know and so it's like this is why like it's so important to have the right product and you can't just bank on the name um who's that one influencer that uh he's not really an influencer but stanford professor um Oh my gosh. Um, who's like, has a really good podcast. Huberman lab. Okay. So Huberman recently has gotten canceled and this guy was beloved, like exactly like MKBHC, but like, like he was, he brought science to the masses on how biology and how everything works, but his personal life, apparently he's had affairs, multiple, uh, you know, it's like cheating on his wife and stuff, but this is like, a beloved Stanford professor, a guy who's like, I mean, this guy looks like Aquaman in a lab coat, right? Like, I mean, this dude is 
like a total G and his research that he does, he's completely changed people's lives because of his research. Um, and he's been able to promote products in the process. And so he really built a good following, but as soon as his personal life came out, he got canceled. So I, I don't think there's influencers necessarily like, uh, totally, um, you know, like th they also have it on the line too. Right. So being authentic is, is really key. I mean, Huberman talks a lot about like faith and he's a man of God and stuff, but he also a scientist. And then he goes and does like find people find out about his, like his affairs. That's clearly like opposing ideas of what a healthy, mentally healthy lifestyle would be. Right. So, um, I think you just have to be authentic. And I think, uh, MKBHC was that this guy needs a uh, tiger woods is a pr agent um all right let's go to the next segment uh we're talking about brand refreshes um and it's interesting because i hope i, I don't know if you've been seeing this but i've been seeing a lot of brand refreshes lately um and i kind of yeah. want to talk about why a company may go through a brand refresh right one is is that they're just trying to change uh what they're known for right uh, a good example of this is starbucks coffee it used, to, it used to be starbucks coffee now it's just plain starbucks uh weight watchers uh you know is now ww uh, Dunkin' Donuts is just Dunkin', um, and they're just trying to change where they are because they just expanded to be, they become bigger than they are, right? The other one is just totally attracting a different audience than they're used to, um, either because the, the product has gotten stale, because CBGs they got a lot more competitors, so they need to do like a refresh. Skittles is a, a good example of this. Skittles just came out with a refresh. Um, and then just, or they're just modernizing the logo uh, so that it's more modern, it's more able to adapt to like digital assets or merchandising. Um, Lamborghini just recently did theirs, right? A very stale product. But so, uh, you know, I think there's brand refreshes are happening. These are why they're happening. But uh, what do you, Adil, you got, you got a brand refresh you like? Yeah, man, I got a good one. Uh, so Bumble right now is going through a midlife crisis. Uh, it's rebranding from its 2014 look. Um, I mean, they've had a few different changes apparently since then, but you know what they, they, if you don't know, if you're like me and you, you know, shout out to the millennials who got married early, I never had to use a dating app. Right. But I learned this just recently that Bumble's differentiator was that women could make the first move. That's their whole shtick. Right. Um, so their new interface, uh, their whole revamp is not only like the change in messaging, the change in the interface, but then also the change in features. And they're doing a big global campaign with this uh, to kind of talk about this whole uh, brand refresh and whatnot. Um, their main goal is to target people who are swearing off dating. That's that's ultimately what they want to target. Uh, this is all happening under the new CEO, uh, I, something Jones, L L Ladane Jones or something like that. I, I didn't catch her name right. But um, in terms of features, look, this is what Bumble has added. They're adding this thing called the opening move. And this gives women a little bit more flexibility in making the first move, uh, still kind of going to what they're known for. Um, Salim, I'm sure you're wondering, what about the non-binary folks? Uh, well, they slash them can set their own preferences for the opening move. Uh, so they've thought about all of that. Um, so talking back about the campaign, because that's what we talk here. Uh, so the campaign is all about targeting people who are dealing with dating fatigue. And yes, it's a real thing. So uh, it's showing women uh, struggling with their dating lives. Uh, one ad in particular shows a woman, you know, texting her friend uh, saying like, I quit dating. I'm so done with all the dating apps. And she swears it all off and goes and becomes a nun. Uh, she tries to fit in with the nun life and like, you know, and all that. And it's like really nice, uh, nice color tones that they did very uh, artsy, but uh, she gets distracted, of course, while she's at this uh, uh, living with the nuns when she sees a shirtless gardener. And so a fellow nun hands her a phone with a uh, with Bumble already open on the screen. And, uh, you know, she goes and pursues dating again because uh, it ends with um, Bumble's tagline. It says, we've changed so you don't have to. Right. Uh, what really makes this campaign stand out, I think, in particular, is the print uh, the print media that they did with it. So they showed like memes, but with vintage paintings. So, and it, all the, all the paintings show like really frustrated women, uh, next to men. So it's like, like a man sitting next to a woman on a park bench and it's a painting of them. And it'll say, have, uh, so do you know about crypto 
or like, uh, uh, do you have any crypto or something like that? Or, um, but I, I sent you flame emojis that, you know, it's like really, it's funny stuff. You just have to take my word for it. Um, Salim, you're like me, you've never used dating apps, but you've probably seen our friends exhausted using them. Like, you know, dating fatigue is. It is. And I think here's what I think Bubble's trying to do. Right? I think Bubble is trying to meet the gap between social media and dating, right? I think it's, it's giving them options. It's letting them be, which even social media still is a, is a, is a, when I say social media, I'm talking about like Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and, and those, those platforms where there are more engagement levels. Um, they're trying to make, make it a little bit more for you to cruise in, right? Scroll down, swipe down, whatever it is, swipe, scroll, right? So you're, you're seeing more, you're learning more about the person. You're, you're putting up their you max scores on there. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it's, it, 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 somebody has to fill that gap. Look, there is a gap and there, there's the whole idea of, Hey, how are we, how's the next generation going to connect and, and meet? And I think, um, there's got, there's gotta be more than just a rebrand for this, right? I think, I think Bumble needs to do a little bit more of mm -hmm. just getting in with the in-person and trying to figure out how do they do like meetup events and stuff like that. I think there's gotta be more, right? Um, but also it could be a, another source of revenue, right? This match.com that owns Bumble lost $40 billion mm -hmm. last year. Like it's just a downhill turn from here, right? It's just a, 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 you know, we talked about it last year, last episode about negative brand businesses and, and how companies still survive. And this is one of them. And, um, they're gonna have to figure this out. Is, is there is spending on a rebrand and refresh important and going to be valuable? Yes. Is it going to change the ticker and, and grow? I think it's going to need more than that. Um, and hopefully they can get it. I, I think it was like uh, six or seven episodes ago, but we talked about Tinder uh, and their refresh and like how they're trying to do um, something different, like more IRL events and things like that. Do you remember yeah. us talking about that? Yep. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. The, it's I, I don't mean to get back onto the same soapbox, but when your whole business model is about keeping people on your dating app and not necessarily finding true love, then of course it's going to cause fatigue because you're, you're like using their emotions of teasing them that yes, you can find love here but then really, we really want you to keep swiping. So you get addicted to this. And, uh, you know, that's, it, it's, it's ultimately going to create a bunch of haters for your product. And, um, <clears throat> I get it. Bumble has this differentiator, but it, people are depressed. I mean, dating apps aren't going to be the solution for people. Uh, ultimately like they, they need real connection and that's why they don't like it. And that's why dating fatigue is a thing. So, they can add this little brand refresh. It's really not going to work. I think uh, they're going to still deal with a lot of dating. Oh, you push it. Sorry. I think it's it's a it's an incentive problem. I think they they just got to figure out a different revenue model for the company. I think that's the challenge, right? I think it's it, it, right now it, it is that like, hey, how long can they stay on the app so I can serve them more, spell you know, sell them more, all that stuff. But I think they just got to figure out a a different revenue model that drives revenue so that for they don't have to do these things and just really focus on what they're meant for to do and which is hook people up. Um, and I think that's going to be their challenge. Yeah. Um, so my brand refresh is actually I'm going to take two brand refreshes and put them together because I think the brand refreshes are actually pretty similar and that's liquid IV and skinny dips. Uh, I think they both just did a rebrand and, and, and if you look at them both, if you put them side to side, you'll see that there's a lot of similarities in these. Uh, one is 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 that they're, they're they're still kind of the same color. So if you do the squint test, they both look the same. But what they really did was is is very simplified the packaging um, to be more Gen Z like, and 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 the idea of putting the product and the flavors and the actual like uh, you know if you look at uh, Liquid IV now they've got the lemon lime kind of like big graphic in there, uh, and you look at Skinny Dips and they put it right in the center of the top, and and the other thing is is that the they both you know prominently put the facts, right? Like, Hey, why is it good for you, um, on these sides? And you look at both the packaging and they're very, very similar. And I think look, the CPG market is, 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 is interesting as, as it gets flooded with these products and services and, and liquid IV was bought by Univar, uh, Univaliver about for $500 million a few years back, and they've never had a rebrand. Um, so I think it's an ideal time that, so that they look more like a, a consumer product for the young, not a, a medical product that sits on a shelf, which is where it looks like before. Um, and I think, you know, and skinny dips is very similar. I think they had, they had good packaging. I think it was bright. It stuck out. 
but I think the facts were missing. And, and when they started talking about all this stuff, nobody actually caught it. They just thought it was like, Hey, look, it's just chocolate cover almonds, uh, with a better name. Right. So I think, uh, both of these brand refreshes are, are, are rebrands are, are great. Um, and I think they're really going to do good for both the companies, but what do you think Adil? Yeah. I, I mean, the original packaging kind of looked, um, uh, like it was some kind of special potion you'd put in it was a lot of text and wording and stuff um but now if you see the new packaging it's all giant fruit images and uh flavor profiles are very clear on it um they've still kept a lot of the same identifier like the block design but um i love that they have sugar free now like that was not as commonly available before it seemed like um now they've like uh made that much more widely available um, so, you know, I got an interesting one. So, um, oh, are you done with skinny dips? Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, one? Yeah, go, 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 go. Yeah, I'm good. Go. So for like another re like a refresh that we've been quietly seeing and maybe just as like a, um, uh, I'm a member at lifetime and, uh, I've, I've seen the lifetime fitness evolve to like more of a country club model and it's becoming just lifetime now. Right. And so, um, right. Is, or is it called just lifetime country it's club lifetime. or something yeah, like it's, that? It's, it's, yeah, we just, I, I just saw that refresh the other day too. It's, it, or I just noticed it too the other day. Right. Cause it, where it became like, they are very trying to, and we have one near our office and they're really trying to become this athletic country club now, uh, yeah. which is what they should, which, which is, very much in line with what they should be, right? They're very, they're trying to be more luxe and, and provide that unique feeling. And I think it's a, you know, you're right on. I think, yeah, we, they quietly did a refresh. Yeah. And it was, it was very quiet because I felt that like when I first joined Lifetime about a year and a half ago. And, um, cause I was going, like, I started going to one of the locations that was an older location. It was very, like, just all about fitness. It looked just was like a gym. Right. And then I started going to the newer location in Frisco, like north of Dallas. And um, I actually was like, I can actually get work done here. Like, and I started working remotely from there. I, you know, um, in on the weekends, you'll, Salim, you'll even see like kids' birthday parties happening at Lifetime. Like, imagine have, having your kid's birthday at a gym, right? Like, you wouldn't do that, but you would have it at your country club, right? So uh, they, they've really bridged that like uh it's more of a wellness lifestyle family center and uh you know country athletic country club is the perfect uh way to describe it but um the the ceo of lifetime he actually has like now perfected uh what he says he's created the perfect gym so they, they used to have one of those corner looking and i'm kind of doing it but uh the the one that they have in Sugarland, that was his original concept yep. for Lifetime. That was the Plano location that I was referring to at the beginning. And now like the Frisco location is what he wants everywhere across the country. So all of them will have pickleball courts, no matter what. They all have to have lounges. They all have to have a bar. They all have to have um, uh, like conference rooms where you can have meetings there and things like that. So he's really like trying to go after this like we want you to spend the whole day here if you want to concept yeah yeah there's like ours one by the office has like lifetime offices space i don't know what it's called spaces or office whatever it is it's basically just like a a we work uh right about the building right and so you can you know rent an office there and just stay there um yeah really cool real well done lifetime and and doing it quietly into the right people and i think that's what it is right when you're trying to be a luxe product or like services you don't need to blast it out uh, you do it, uh, and the people that need to know need to know, right? It's pretty cool. Good, 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 good work. The last segment I want to talk about um, is is this whole idea of in person versus online, right? I think we talked about it earlier with the trending brands of how some are dying and some are going to brick and mortar and some are going away. But even just in an event standpoint, right? For me, the reason that this topic came up is, man, I'm at conferences and meetings, traveling more than I usually am, and 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 I just don't know if it was me or if it's just everybody else and, and seeing all these different things, but. Uh, C event did a did a did a data data dump um, and noticed that hey look, the global events industry is is, is expected to grow to two trillion by twenty thirty two with a CAGR of six percent um, from now till twenty thirty two, um, and and seventy percent of events are still being conducted in person. We saw this drop significantly during COVID and post COVID years, and we started seeing you know even in our own physical events uh, we saw 
people come less and less and less. Um, but now the only thing that's changing is that it's, it's becoming smaller groups, but the events are more uh, happening more often. Um, and they're wanting to see people more often in person than it is online. And, you know, we're seeing that, you know, online viewing is dropping. Only 68% of people are, are watching virtual events that are more than 20 minutes. So if anything's bigger than 20 minutes, they're pretty much out. And, you know, 50%, 58% of virtual events host 330 people or fewer uh, are, are, are just, uh, are, you know, they're just dying. They're not, they're not going any higher anymore. So uh, we're seeing conferences come back, coming back with a bang. I was at one earlier this week. I'll be at RSA next week. Um, what do you think of it? What do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on in-person versus uh, online uh, events and activities? Yeah, man, I, I, I was kind of talking to you guys about this new show that uh, our industry put on um, in Florida of all places, right? So 38 Florida, um, a bunch of fashion brands got together and hosted some of the largest um, uh, retailers in the country. And it was so different because these same retailers who we used to see at a Vegas show don't care to go to Vegas anymore. They don't care to go to a trade show. They would rather just go see the the people they want to deal with on a much smaller scale um, and in a very relaxed setting. Um, and I think the, you know, Vegas is actually going to probably see, um, see this trend change too, because the traditional trade show, I think has started to take a hit. Um, it's, it's not that way anymore. Like, like people don't come in large droves like they used to. Um, I mean, we used to send 10 people from our team just to go work a booth because we said we really want to make, do a bang, right? Like we want to have a huge presentation and like go all out, but we see maybe a quarter of the people there now. Um, and you know, business hasn't necessarily like dipped in that sense, like at that show it has, but you know, overall, like we're still fine. It's just like, we're seeing them, seeing these same customers in smaller settings, in different settings. Um, so in person, like these temp events, it's, I, I guess I don't follow it as closely as you do. So I'd probably want to know like what you you're seeing more so on that. Um, but when it comes to like what you said about Hollister, you know, they're, they're closing their stores, right. And they're going all online, you know, so that's like a good like, chunk of them are. Yeah. So, I mean, the in-person thing is like, I think everyone says, oh, in-person matters, but ultimately like billion dollar brands are built online and they don't ever have to open a store either. Right. And so it, it really just depends on what value you can give online um, or a virtual, you know, any virtually uh, virtual event even. Um, but I don't know. I think in-person is just like people want to use their time more effectively now. They don't want to go to a trade show for a week and just drink every night. I, I, I... Yeah, I think the evening activities have definitely slowed down. We've seen that, right? Part of my job is to go to these events and then take customers and entertain them out. And most people are now calling a night by 10, 11 o'clock. It doesn't matter if it's Vegas or San Francisco or, or, or Florida. It's just people are, people don't care enough to, to do that stuff. It's just, I think people now value their own time and they've learned that and think COVID's part of it, right? COVID was part of it. Like they understand that, hey, look, here's what's important to me. Here's what really matters. All this stuff is nice and it's extra, but um, we don't need this. And, and we're seeing that as well. But even in the in-person events, we've started to do more, uh, you know, very unique experiences. So it's like, hey, if I'm going to bring you out here, it's going to be worth your while. It's not because I want to educate you about one thing and that's really it, which you could probably just YouTube online, right? Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about real experiences that you're going to have and, uh, and, and provide you an experience, right? We are taking a couple of customers out to dinner, but they're getting like mm -hmm. tasting menus of a restaurant that they've never been to, or uh, they're coming in and they're getting customized tailored, you know, you know, merchandising or something like that. So it's, it's very particular to them that they get some sort of a, a get out of it. Um, and I think that's going to be the future, right? If you, if you're not providing them an experience, then it's, uh, it's really just not value for them, right? Our, our motto has always been know me, like me, trust me, pay me. Like if, if you know me then, and you like me and you want to do business with me, then, um, you know, you'll eventually trust me because I'm going to do the right thing for you because you know me, I'm authentic and then you'll pay me. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. This, uh, it's a really good debate overall in person versus online. Cause it, it's a never ending. <laughs> it's, it's just going to be never ending. We're always going to be talking about if what's more effective and it's ultimately it is a balance of the two. That's the best yeah. way. 
so, your audience. This is but, a good episode. So, so yeah, it's definitely great, man. I uh, enjoy it. Samir, we missed you. Um, needed some more data points uh, that I didn't have, but I tried. I tried to do my best without you, man. All right. So, listeners, you guys tell us if Samir's Batman, is it me or Salim? <laughs> Give us your vote. Tell us what you think. All right, man. All right. Ciao. Men go mad. Who's gone mad? Mad men. You're mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. mad. <laughs>